This is something that I did actually um, last <coughs> semester with uh, Hui Nguyen, who's a, a graduate student in, in Princeton. Okay, so throughout this talk, we're going to have a really tall, skinny matrix. Um, n by d matrix, n is much bigger than d. And the rank of this matrix is, is r. And for a lot of the talk, I'm just going to start assuming r is d. But um, what I'm going to talk about makes sense for arbitrary r less than d as well. And I'm going to talk about something that's going to speed up algorithms for many well-studied uh, numerical linear algebra problems such as, for example, computing leverage scores of a matrix. That's just, what are the leverage scores? Um, look at the n standard basis vectors in Rn, and project each one of them to the subspace spanned by the columns of A, and look at their norms in the subspace. Those are, those are called the leverage scores. Least squares regression is a commonly studied one. So you have an overdetermined system of linear equations, and you want to find a solution, you know, there might not be a solution, so you want to find one that's as good a solution as possible, meaning minimize the sum of square distances to the line you find, for example. Okay. And as, uh, instead of L2 norm, you can measure it under, you know, LP, for example, LP regression. Low rank approximation is yet another one. So I, I just give you here a matrix A, and I, and I tell you, find me the best rank K approximation to A. And best is under some norm, say for Bemius norm on this slide. Okay. And yet another problem is preconditioning, which is actually used as a subroutine to speed up some least squares regression algorithms. Basically find, so for this I'm going to assume D is R, find a matrix R such that AR is well conditioned. Okay. Then you can run iterative algorithms for least squares regression, such as gradient descent, which are faster. Okay, so any questions about the statements of any problems? The nor so look at the subspace spanned by the columns of A and project the n standard basis vectors onto that subspace and look at their L2 norms. Yeah. Um, right. So these are just some, a list of some well-studied linear algebra problems. Um, and you know, where this talk is going to lead is kind of um, one tool that lets you speed up algorithms for all these problems. So what do you mean by arc min? Um, so the x, which minimizes that expression. Oh, oh I see. The argument. Yeah. OK. So you know, before we talk about speeding up solutions to these problems, let me just tell you, you know, how can you compute a solution even slowly to any of these problems? Okay. So theorem, every matrix has, what, has what's known as a singular value decomposition. And what is that? It's writing a matrix A as the product of three matrices with some structure. So the middle matrix sigma is diagonal, and all the, positive, and all the entries on the diagonal are strictly positive. Those are called the singular values. And the matrices U and V um, have orthonormal columns. Okay. So every, it's known that every matrix can be written as a product of three matrices in this way. And in fact, you can compute. Um, you can approximate the SVD actually uh, quickly. So you can do it in n times d squared using standard matrix multiplication algorithms. <laughs> but you can also do it using fast matrix multiplication in time, say, n times d to the 1.3 something something. Okay. So the question that we're going to focus on in this talk is, can we solve the problems on the previous slide faster than computing the SVD? And why can you use the SVD to solve all these problems? Well, I'm not going to mention the connection to LP regression because there's some non-trivial reduction there. But um, what I'm going to talk about in this talk, it's known that it can apply to LP regression as well. But the leverage scores you can prove are just the row norms of U. Um, well, how do you minimize, for a least squares regression, how do you minimize the norm of AX minus B? You should choose X such that AX is the projection of B onto the columns, column span of A. And if you choose x to be that, then ax will be uu transpose b, which is exactly that. Um, low rank approximation, basically just keep the top k, uh, the largest singular values in sigma, and zero everything else out. So that's the Eckhart-Young theorem tells you that that is the best approximation under Frobenius norm. And preconditioning, 
if you output v sigma inverse, well, a times that has condition has um, it's perfectly well conditioned. Uh, it's an, it has orthonormal columns. Okay. So good. So once you have the SVD, you can solve these problems very easily. But can we go faster than actually computing the SVD? Okay. So that's the question of this talk. So there was an idea proposed by Sarloche just about seven years ago to speed up all these algorithms. And, and the approach is to use what's known as a subspace embedding. So first let me define what a subspace embedding is. And then I'll show you at least safer regression why, you know, why would you want a subspace embedding. So let's say we have V being a linear subspace of dimension D. A subspace embedding is just a matrix pi that preserves all the norms approximately for any vector in the subspace V, okay? up to say 1 plus epsilon. And the point here is this, uh, this value M, pi is an M by N matrix. This value M, I want to be as small as possible. You know? So M definitely cannot be less than D, because otherwise something in the subspace will be in the kernel of pi, and I won't preserve its norm. Um, but I want, to, I want M you know, to be as close to D as possible. I mean, in fact, you, know, you can always get such a pi with M being D, but computationally, we, we want a, a way to come up with a, a pi quickly, which has M as close to D as possible. And it's known from lots of previous work that kind of all five problems I listed previously, if you can get a good subspace embedding quickly, you can solve those problems more quickly. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you, you know, it's, it's really simple for some of them. Some of them require some non-trivial reduction. But let's look at, for example, just say least squares regression. How do you use a subspace embedding to speed up least squares regression? OK, so I'm going to take pi. Suppose I had a way to come up with subspace embeddings quickly. I'm going to take pi to be a subspace embedding for this subspace, the one spanned by the columns of A as well as the vector B. It's at most d plus 1 dimensional. Right? And x star is the optimal solution for the original least squares regression problem. And x tilde is the optimal for the new you know, dimensionality reduced version of the problem, where I multiply both a and b by pi. Well, definitely this is true. x tilde is the minimizer, so it certainly is better to use x tilde for this new problem than x star. Right? And then x star is the minimizer for ax minus b. But x tilde is the minimizer for pi a and pi, and pi b. And then now you just use you know, what it means to be a subspace embedding. So pi a x tilde minus pi b is just pi times this vector. This vector is in the subspace I just defined, so it, it, it uh, preserves the norm approximately. And then you do the same thing on the other side. a x star minus b is also in the subspace. And then you just move 1 minus epsilons around, and you get this. Okay, so this tells me that if I reduce the problem using a subspace embedding and then solve this new problem, then I get an approximately optimal solution. Okay. And the point here is um, I only need to do an SVD on pi A, which is a much smaller matrix. Okay. Okay, so, so, the, so this is the point. Computing the SVD of pi A is faster if m is much less than n. In fact, we're going to shoot for m being approximately d. So it will be better for tall, skinny matrices. So the point is if w minus omega minus 1 was what? Which, uh, Say 1.3 something something. Yeah. So I mean, we're not saving on the d to the omega minus 1 part, but we're saving on, instead of multiplying that by n, we're going to multiply it by something like, well, like we're d. Not saving on the omega. Yeah, we're not saving on that. We're saving on the n part. For the, for the sake of these problems. Yeah, for the sake of these problems. If you have an n by d regression, so basically the theorem is going to say if you have an n by d regression problem, you can very quickly turn it into a roughly d by d regression problem. That's going to be, and, and similar for the other problems. If you have this big n by d problem, you can turn it into a very low dimensional one. Which is not general. So in a lot of these cases, a yeah. is going to be a very sparse matrix. So you don't yes. even need to use the, the omega. So, and the problem is, is pi a might be dense at that point. Oh, OK, good. So I'm going to get to that very, very soon. Right. And then I'll ask you if you're satisfied. OK. OK, right. <laughs> okay good. So, okay, so good news uh, is that 
it's known that, so you know, part of, this, part of the issue here is we need to come up with a good subspace embedding, right? So we need an algorithm to do that. So it's known that there is a good algorithm to come up with a subspace embedding. In fact, the algorithm is so good it doesn't even need to look at the input. You just pick a random matrix and it's a subspace embedding with high probability. So pick a random matrix with Gaussian entries and, 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 do, and do some, via some net argument you can show that with high probability you'll, you'll preserve everything in the subspace. The bad news is that if you pick a random dense matrix like this, then, okay, sure, once we have the pi A, pi B problem, we can solve it quickly. But to actually multiply pi times A is even slower than solving the original problem. So this is of no use for us. But of course, you know, Sarlosh, Sarlosh was able to implement his idea successfully seven years ago. And his idea was don't pick a random Gaussian matrix. Pick a random matrix that has some structure, and in particular, some kind of structure that allows you to multiply by it quickly. Okay, so he used some FFT-based approach that I'm not going to get into. But the bottom line is his target dimension m, it wasn't d over epsilon squared. It was, it was like d log d over epsilon squared. It was very close. But it had the property that pi x for any vector x can be multiplied in n log n time via the FFT. So you can compute pi A in n log n times d time by just doing it column by column of the matrix A. Okay, so this tells us that by using his approach, we can solve least squares regression in time n d log n plus roughly d to the omega. So we reduced it to this roughly d by d problem in nearly linear time, right? I mean, the input is of size n times d. By paying an extra log n factor over this size of the input, we've reduced the problem a lot. And now coming back to your question, so you know, can we do better? Well, ND is the size of, is, is the dimensionality of the input, you know, but a lot of matrices are sparse. So you know, it, it might not take anywhere near n times d um, numbers to specify the input. So can we do better for sparse matrices? And that's really what this talk is about. And what, what Clarkson and, uh, and Woodruff showed very recently is that it's possible to construct a pi with poly d over epsilon rows. So not, not d, but poly d, such that each column has exactly one non-zero entry, each column of pi. So pi is a very sparse matrix. Okay. And what's the advantage of this? The advantage of this is you can multiply pi times a, not in nd log n time, but in what I'll call number of non-zero entries of a time. So it's really linear in the input sparsity as opposed to linear in the dimensions of the input. Okay. Um, and then once you have this new problem, you can solve it however you want. I mean, um, if you use, say, these omega algorithms, you'll get one bound. But really, it's a, it's a reduction kind of theorem. It says um, you can turn your n by d problem into poly d by d in this time. So does that address your? Okay, so what this talk about is about is really understanding kind of the power of these sparse subspace embeddings. So, uh, whoops, so, okay, so S throughout this talk, little s, is the number of non zero entries per column of pi. Okay, so what Clarkson and Woodruff showed via a pretty sophisticated argument is that you can take S to be 1 and M to be roughly d squared times. You know, some large, poly, lo, large logarithmic factors in D, log of the sixth, anyway. And it was known from previous work that you can get some non trivial sparsification over dense Gaussian matrices. In particular, even though you'll have d over epsilon squared rows, you'll only have d over epsilon non zeros per column. But I mean, um, it's still pretty slow to multiply by these matrices, right? So, what I'm going to show you in this talk is that, in fact, you can get something very close to this bound. Instead of d over epsilon squared, you'll get d to the 1 plus gamma, where gamma could be, is an arbitrarily small constant of your choice, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, whatever. And the number, of num no, the number of non zero entries per column does not depend on d at all. It only depends on how close you want to be to d. Okay. So O sub gamma means I'm hiding some factors that depend on 1 over gamma. Uh, it's polynomial in 1 over gamma. And also, I'm going to show you quite a simple proof that gets d squared over epsilon squared with s being 1, 
And in fact, uh, there's a, we also have a lower bound showing that you, you cannot go below d squared. Okay. Any question about statement of uh, anything? OK. And implication of our improvements, you know, there were five problems that were listed previously. Um, I'll just state it for, say, regression. Um, and to simplify, you know, there are, some, there are many parameters here. I'll just say it in terms, I won't write the dependence on epsilon. But um, so with one non-zero per column, the previous work could get, you know, n and za time, and then they could solve the new problem in d cubed log to the seventh, whereas all those logs are now gone, and it's a single log. Or if you use um, the approach where you get very close to d, you can get running time where there's actually some constant depending on 1 over gamma that multiplies n and za. But then d cubed turns into d to the omega. So you can actually get matrix multiplication time. Um, I guess other implications, say, are you can, you know, the problem becomes smaller, so you could potentially store it in memory more easily. But anyway, for the rest of the talk, I want to show you how we prove these last two points. But before I go into that, any questions? No. So first, let me just tell you what this subspace embedding pi is. It's going to be a distribution. Just like before I said a random Gaussian matrix works, we're going to take some random matrix from some distribution. And I'll tell you what that distribution is. So we can use any one of these two distributions. And that actually OSNAP stands for something, oblivious sparse norm approximating projections. Um, basically, we just need a distribution that satisfies certain properties. And I'm not going to write down the bullet points of what the properties need to be. But here, here are two simple constructions which both satisfy the properties we need. So the first one is very simple. Um, for each column independently, we'll choose little less random locations without replacement. And we'll put random signs there divided by some scale factor. For the second construction, we're going to break up the columns, or sorry, the rows of pi into s blocks, each of equal size m over s. And we're going to pick one random entry in each block and put a random sign there. Um, and I should point out that you know, these matrices, I mean, they've been used in sort of related work before, which I'm not going to get into in this talk. Um, but I guess what we show is that these things work as well for subspace embeddings. What does that acronym up there stand for? Oblivious, spar oblivious because it doesn't look at the subspace. Okay. Sparse norm approximating projections. Actually, we just wanted to have some acronym which sounded nifty. <laughs> okay. Um, analysis. So I want to show you now why these matrices work. Okay, so really, what does it mean for pi to be a subspace embedding? Before we move on to how to show that it is one, what does it really mean to be one? Okay, so this is the definition I gave you before. For every x in the subspace v, pi x should have its norm roughly uh, the norm of x. OK, so what is a subspace? Well, we can take an orthonormal basis for this subspace, right? And put the, that orthonormal basis as the columns of a matrix U. So the subspace is really all vectors of the form U times Y, a linear combination of, this, of the, the vectors in this basis. So this thing is just writing x is equal to U times Y. It's equivalent to this. For all Y, the norm of pi U is roughly equal to the norm of, the norm of pi UY is roughly equal to the norm of UY. But u has orthonormal columns, so the norm of ui is the same as the norm of y. Right? So it's just saying that the norm of pi ui is roughly the norm of y for all y. And that's just saying that the singular values of pi u are all between 1 minus epsilon and 1 plus epsilon. It's the same as saying the eigenvalues of this matrix capital S, pi u transpose pi u, should be between 1 minus epsilon squared and 1 plus epsilon squared. OK. And just triangle inequality, the norm of SY, you know, I can add and subtract the identity and get that the norm of SY is always between these two quantities. So really, I just need to show that the operator norm of S minus I is small. It's at most roughly epsilon. OK. And then you do Markov's inequality. Right? So 
What's the probability that the operator norm of s minus i is bigger than t? I can raise both sides to the L, apply Markov's inequality, and then I say this is the largest eigenvalue raised to the L, and that's the sum of each eigenvalue raised to the L, so it's an upper bound. If L is, say, um, an even integer, so that those things are positive. Any questions? So really, all I need to show is that, so what, you know, what, what does it mean to say that pi, this, ran, this distribution I told you before for pi, that it's a good um, subspace embedding with high probability for any subspace. What I need to show you is that for all u with orthonormal columns, um, the probability over pi of pi u transpose pi u minus identity bigger than t is, is small. Right? And I'm going to bound this thing by that. So really, it's all, it all comes down to bounding the trace of this random matrix raised to a large power. And I'm going to point out, you know, oh, so OK, good. So, um, so that's what we need to show. And we're just going to, we're going to do two things. W one thing we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we can choose L, notice, right? L can be any even integer, and this is true. So if we choose L to be 2, we're going to get that m can be roughly d squared over epsilon squared, and the sparsity can be 1. And if we choose L to be roughly log d, we can get the other bound that I promised you. And by the way, this is, you know, this approach of bounding operator norms of random matrices by, by traces of large powers is, is not anything new. People have been doing this since the beginning of random matrices. Okay, so um, what I guess the devil is in the details here. I'm going to have to show you for this particular pi and for any u that this is going to hold. Okay. So how do you do it when L is equal to 2? So first of all, I want to understand what this matrix S minus I looks like. You know, can I write down some explicit formula for its entries? Yeah, I can. Right? So <clears throat> let's say the columns of U are U1 up to UD. These are orthonormal vectors. And remember, pi IJ, it has some random signs in some locations, and it has zeros in other locations. So delta is an indicator random variable telling me if it's non-zero. And sigma is a random sign. And if you sit down and just spend a few moments computing what the entries of s minus i look like, you'll get something. OK? Um, so now it's, at least for l equals 2, it's something very simple. You know, what is the trace of a matrix squared when the matrix is symmetric? It's just it's for Benius norm squared. OK? So I told you we need to bound the expected trace of this matrix squared, it's just it's a computation. You do it, um, and you get something, and you, you get the bound I promised you. It's something very simple. OK? The um, you mean specify them using few random bits? Oh, you can so, one pi that will work for all subspaces. Yeah, you cannot. You cannot. Yeah, you cannot. But, you, but this does give a small family of pies that works. Because, um, so, OK, just I'll say a few words about this. So we need to bound the expected Frobenius norm squared of this matrix. So when you square these entries and sum them up, you're, you're going to turn out to only need four-wise independence and pairwise independence of some random variables. And we know how to, how to generate such families very efficiently. So even though pi is this big m by n matrix, it's actually specified by a logarithmic number of bits. So there is a polynomial-sized family uh, such that picking pi from that family will give you this guarantee. OK, so now I'm going to get into maybe the more interesting uh, part of the talk, okay. which is how to do it for L being log D. It becomes something not as simple. Oh, good. So Right, so once I have this, I can just set m. Anyway, it's roughly d squared over epsilon squared, up to constant factors. Yeah. Do we know if one of our terms here is optimal? Um, I think so. We definitely have the lower bound of d squared, and we have a lower bound of one over epsilon squared additive. So d squared plus one over epsilon squared is a lower bound. Uh, I don't, we don't have a lower bound that says you have to take the product. 
I suspect that you do, but I don't have a proof of that. Any other questions? OK, so how about larger L? So this, this becomes a little bit more work. And uh, actually, most of the rest of what I'll talk about is, is this. OK, so just some, before we move on, just some basics. So if you take any square matrix and raise it to a power and look at its ijth entry, what is the ijth entry? It's the sum over all paths of length L, where the first thing in the path is i and the last thing is j of the product of all entries of the matrix along that path. Okay, so you can just prove this by induction. And that implies that the trace, well, the trace is the case where i equals j. Right? So you sum up over all the cases where i is equal to j, meaning i1 equals il plus 1, of the same thing. Okay, so um, now we just need to apply this where b is this s minus i. s minus i, by the way, is a d by d matrix. Okay. Okay, good. So we just plug it in, and it's uh, some big expression, and we need some way of managing this thing. Okay. And the strategy, and it's a strategy that's been used before, is is we're going to associate. With each monomial in the summation above, a graph. Okay? And we're going to group together monomials that have the same graph structure. And then we're going to, we're going to, I'm going to show you that the contribution of a graph to this big summation only depends on graph properties like number of connected components and number of vertices, et cetera, et cetera. And then we need to do some counting. Okay? to count how many different graphs are there with various parameters. So this is something that um, has been done before in, in you know, this idea of associating monomials with graphs. Kind of the novelty here is in the details that we're going to get to soon. Any questions? OK. So first let me explain to you this, how we're going to draw the graphs. Okay, given a monomial, you know, given one of these products of, uh, I guess, 6L terms, how are we going to turn it into a graph? So first of all, all the graphs that I'm going to show you, the way, so all the graphs that arise here are going to have three layers. Okay, the leftmost layer corresponds to the different Ks in the summation. The middle layer corresponds to the Is and Js. And the right layer corresponds to the Rs. Okay, so k is something between 1 and d. It's a column. i and j is a row. It's between 1 and n. And r is between 1 and m, a row of pi. The r's correspond to rows of the matrix pi. So when you expand, yeah, so if you write down what the k, k prime entry is of s minus i, it's some expression. 1 over s times a sum over rows of pi. Pi has m rows. And then a sum over i not equal to j. These are rows of a, or of u, of something. So moving back here, the r's are the rows of pi. The i's and j's are the rows of u. And the k's are the columns of u. So we're going to split up. We're going to draw a three-layered graph for every monomial. Okay? And the, the middle corresponds to the distinct rows of u that appear amongst the i's and j's. So you know, i1, not, I1 does not equal to j1, but it could certainly equal j7 or I, i6 or whatever. right? So we're going to remember what's equal to what in the middle layer. Things that equal the same thing go to the same vertex. Same thing on the right. Different r's which are actually equal will be using the same vertex on the right. The left is different. Okay? On the left, we're just going to have l vertices. So even if k1 equals k5, we're not going to remember that. They're just, they're gonna we're going to have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 up to L. OK. And then now, this is how we draw a graph. So you basically, you know, we look, so we look at t being 1 and t up to L. And for each value of t, we're going to draw four edges on this graph. And we're going to number these edges 1 up to 4L in the order that we visit them. OK, so the first, when t is 1, you know, it tells us some r, rt, and it tells us some i and j, it and jt, right? So 
that's you know, the first r we saw, and then the first i and j we saw. And then we go from kt to kt plus 1. So it goes from 1 to 2. Okay, and we just keep doing that for each t. So the next, the next, when t is 2, we get some other things. You know, maybe they reused the same i and j and the same r, et cetera. And we do that for t equals 3 and t equals 4. So k, k1 equals kl plus 1, and we will encode that in the graph. We're going to finally, at the end, go back to the, the starting k. And at the end of the day, we get a graph that corresponds to a monomial. Okay. So the point of this slide is just, you know, there is some deterministic way of turning these things into graphs. And now we want to start bounding things in terms of graph structure. OK, so the first thing to notice is that, OK, so neither this nor this depends on the k's at all. OK? So if you take, you can move the summation over k all the way here. And the summation over k of that expression turns out to be the product of, of dot products of rows of u. OK? So this is something you can see if you write it down. Um, and sorry, that, that really should say ujt uit plus 1. So u superscript i is the ith column, u subscript i is the ith row. OK, so now what's next? Well, a few things to observe. We're going to take the expectation of this, right? So oh yeah, that was just for this, uh, this example. But l is going to be in log d, an even integer roughly log d. Um, so let's, let's label some parameters of this graph g. And I'll tell you what g hat means shortly. So we're taking the expectation of this thing. Now, these sigmas, some of the sigmas might equal each other because some of the r's and the i's equal each other. Okay. If any sigma is raised to an odd power, its expectation is 0. So we only need to remember the case where all the sigmas have even powers. And this, by the way, I mean, this kind of thing happens, you know, this is, anyway, some of this stuff is kind of standard in random matrices. I mean, if you, if you look at, say, the operator norm of a, of a random sign matrix, you'll be doing similar stuff. I'll, I'll tell you shortly what's kind of what's interesting and new here. Um, so in order for the sigmas to not vanish, each one of the edges between the middle and the right has to have even multiplicity. Also, how many distinct deltas appear in that product? It's the number of distinct edges between the middle and the right. So even though we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 edges here, there are only four distinct edges. So I'm going to use little b to denote the number of distinct edges between the middle and the right, and z to denote the number of distinct vertices on the right. So the expectation of any given delta is s over m, right? Because you have s non-zero entries per column, and the column has m locations. So a random place is going to be non-zero with probability s over m. So the expectation of that product is s over m to the b. And then there are at most m to the z choices for the r's. Those are, those are rows of pi. OK, so the only trouble here is that, is remember, remember the, the plan, the game plan here. The game plan was encode monomials using graphs, bound the contribution of a graph only in terms of graph structure, and then do combinatorics on graphs. So this is great. That's in terms of graph structure, number of vertices, number of distinct edges. And then we have some messy thing there, which we need to also bound in terms of graph structure so we can execute the plan I told you. Okay. So for that, I'm going to define, in terms of g, I'm going to define what I call g hat, the dot product graph. And the point here is just, each one of these left vertices, when, I, when you draw g the way I told you, ha, yeah? Here do you sample with replacement, the, the, the column where you put 1, or not? So it's without replacement. So it's not exactly s over m to the b. But you, the, inequal, the inequality is true. All right. um, yeah. So I didn't define what the, these, you know, I said there's a family of distributions that all work to make this analysis work. Really what you want is that 
the locations of the non-zeros should be negatively correlated within a column. Um, OK, good. So the way I define this graph G, every vertex on the left has degree exactly 2, connecting two rows of U. And then when you summed up over that thing, you got a dot product of those two rows. So the dot product graph is just the graph induced on the middle layer by the dot product specified by the left layer. Right? And in the case of this graph here, it's a four cycle. Right? So this A is connected to D, et cetera. Okay? So now what I'm going to show you is we can bound this thing in terms of Oh, um, yeah, so I mean, as we're going to see, it's, uh, it's not, uh, not going to be so dangerous. Yeah. It, it is, okay, it, 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 it is, it would be very bad to bound it by putting the absolute values here. But it turns out that putting them here is fine, and it's still true. This inequality is still true. So. Okay. So now we're going to do some interesting stuff. And th this is really where things get, this is where the novelty is going to start coming in and where things get a little interesting. OK, so now what I want to show you is that um, we can bound this just in terms of some very simple thing, simple property of g hat. And, and, and actually, it's going to be let, let you know, capital C be the number of connected components of this graph g hat. In general, by the way, you know, g is definitely connected. In fact, it's specified by a tour. But the g hat you get out of it is not necessarily connected. You can draw examples where there are lots of connected components. Okay? And the bound we're going to shoot for is d, the number of columns of u, the dimensionality of the subspace, d raised to the number of connected components. Okay? So I'm going to move to this later. If all the edges in G hat have even multiplicity, by the way, G hat itself can have multi-edges, and it can have self-loops even. If all the edges have even multiplicity, it turns out D to the C, you can get D to the C as a bound, exactly. But as you see here, you don't always have the case where everything has even multiplicity. So how about when G hat doesn't have this property? So it helps for this proof to really think about everything in terms of pictures. Okay, so what does this picture mean? It means a product of a product of stuff where each edge is basically think of it as a product of edges. Okay? That's how you should think of these these pictures. This g hat is a product of four edges, which are which are dot products of, of rows, but anyway. So I mean uh, maybe I'll throw it out uh, just so you know if how would you turn this into something with even edge multiplicities? Just something very, without worrying about number of connected components at all. Just do something. Well, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you. So one thing you could do is say, oh, I'll just use AMGM, right? I mean, uh, this is a product, right? I'll just split it arbitrarily into two sets of edges and do AMGM on those and get something, right? Any questions about this picture? Oh, AM, yeah. Arithmetic mean is at most geometric mean. Oh, uh, yes. Right? So, I mean, uh, people see what I'm doing with the picture. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, the, the trouble with this is that. Huh? Oh, yeah. So, the trouble with doing this is that what are we shooting for? We're shooting a bound in terms of the number of connected components, and this has one connected component, and this has two connected components. And in fact, you know, imagine you had a, a, a cycle on L vertices. You can move from one connected component to L over two of them. So th this turns out to be, to just not work at all. Okay? So we're going to force it to work. Okay? And how are we going to force it to work? Um, yeah, so, so this is unacceptable. That's what I was just saying. How are we going to force it to work? We're going to use a theorem. So this is the AM, we're going to do the AMGM trick done right. And the theorem just says that if you have a graph that has edge connectivity at least 2k, then the graph must have at least k edge disjoint spanning trees. OK, remember, edge, what is edge connectivity? Edge connectivity 2k means if you look at any cut of your graph, 
partition of the vertice vertices into two sets, there are at least 2k edges crossing the partition. That's what it means to have edge connectivity 2k. Okay. And how are we going to do? How are we going to use this? Well, we're going to use this theorem when k is equal to two. Right. And basically, what was the trouble? You know, if we had two edge distorting spanning trees, we could have done the trick before, right? Because this split of the edges into two sets is arbitrary. I can choose how to do it. So I'll take one spanning tree and put it in this, and I'll take the other spanning tree and put it in that. And all the leftover edges I can put wherever I want. And then when I do the AMGM trick, I haven't increased, I haven't increased the number of connected components at all. Okay? So if every connected component has two edges joint spanning trees, we're done. Otherwise, by this theorem, there must be some connected component that is not four edge connected. Okay? And also what you can show just in the, based on the way I define the graph, you can show that every connected component of G hat is Eulerian. And what I mean by that is all the cuts have an, an even number of edges crossing them. You can show this. Okay. So a connected component is connected. So any cut, if it doesn't have four edges going across it, it must have two. So let's draw a picture. So what's the bad case? The bad case is that one of the connected components looks like this. There's some cut that has two edges crossing it. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to eliminate one side of the cut. OK? So remember the expression that we had before. A, a, a dot product graph g hat corresponds to a, a product of dot products of rows of u. So T, one side of the cut, has all the edges here, these red edges. That's a bunch of dot products of rows. Then we have the dot product between C and A, which is just you know, UIC transpose UIA. And then we have all the dot products coming from the T bar side of the cut. And then finally, we have B dot producted with D, which is the last thing there. OK, so when you write, when you write it out this way, what do you see? This is a matrix. OK? This big thing, sum over IV, UIA, blah, 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 UIB transpose is a matrix. I'm going to call that matrix M. And I'm actually going to think of this graph as just being the T side of the graph with a new dot product between C and D. But this dot product has an, a matrix M associated with it. So it's actually UIC dot producted with M times UID. And what you can show. So, so what's the strategy? The strategy is just we repeatedly eliminate size two cuts until we force everything to have two edges joint spanning trees. And then we do the trick, the AMGM trick. And I mean, you have these matrices M that are kind of floating around. And you have to, you know, you have to say something about them to make everything work. And it turns out that the thing you need to say about them to make them work is that their operator norms are bounded, bounded by one, in fact. OK? And you know, there could be many such cuts that have size exactly two. But it turns out that if you choose the cut that's minimal, meaning that t bar is as small as possible, then you can show that such a minimal cut gives rise to an m that always has operator norm at most one. So that's some proof I'm not going to say on the slide. But you can show this. OK? So that's, that's that. Uh, any questions about anything? OK. Whoops. So th that, that was a reduction which said that you know, we can basically, by doing all of this, we, can, we, can only, we, can, um, we only have to think about the case where all the edge multiplicities are even. So how do you handle the case where all the edge multiplicities are even? So here's a G, here's a G hat. Okay? I want to get a bound of D cubed for this. OK. <coughs> so it's something that's going to be even simpler. So here's the rough idea. Ui, uj, dot product that's squared, right? Because for any i and j, I have at least I have an even number of edges between them, so it's you're going to be raised to an even power. Is equal to this, right? And also something that's also that you can show pretty simply is that the sum of these rank one matrices are the identity matrix, just because the, just using the fact that the columns are orthonormal. <coughs> 
So what does this mean? This means that whenever I have a graph with all uh, edge multiplicities being even, if I choose a vertex, just choose an arbitrary vertex and sum up over all the choices for it, I replace all the edges, all the double edges connecting to it, by self loops on the things that were connected to it, right? So if this is the identity matrix when I sum up over ui, I replaced ui.uj squared with uj.uj. So in graph terms, we can choose any vertex we want and replace edges with self loops. And you know, we'll see a picture. So, what, you know, what, so the only choice we have really is to what order do we sum over the vertices to bound this thing. So you know, here's a graph g hat, for example. I can choose an order to sum over vertices. Let me you know, sum over the middle first. Okay, so what happens there? That gets a self loop put on it as well as this. That's a terrible idea. I increase the number of connected components. But there's always a good order. And what's a good order? A better order is to just sum from bottom up. If I sum up over that, I put a self loop on him. If I sum up over that, I do that. Great. And, and once you have one vertex, you know, it's very easy to get a bound of d. In general, what should you do? So for each connected component, you should take a spanning tree and then sum up over the vertices lower in the tree first. So let me just do a picture of that. Here's an arbitrary g hat, or here's one of the connected components. Take a spanning tree of that g hat, step one. And then now just do, do what I told you going from the bottom to the bottom. Okay? And then you'll never increase the number of connected components. And then you'll land with one vertex at the end, which is the root of the tree. Okay, okay good. So I have time. I, you know, in, in the last few minutes, I want to um, I want to give you some open problems. Okay. So, yeah. Oh yeah. So yeah. I guess I didn't. I'm not. I'm not wrapping it up. So uh, yeah. Wrapping it up now. Now you need to do some computations. And. Uh, and the computation show you didn't lose. Uh, yeah. And, and you can do them. Yeah. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's, Yeah, I guess I, I guess what I tried to do is to show you all the non-deterministic steps in the proof, and then from there, you know, you can do what you know you can just do it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a list of open problems. So you know, well, if you improved omega, you would uh, also improve the running time of all these algorithms. And in fact, if omega is two, um, you know, then well, then it's linear time. Um, another thing, another question that, you know, we don't have any reason to believe that you can't do this. So I gave you an algorithm for approximate least squares regression, right? The subspace embedding thing it preserved norms of vectors up to 1 plus epsilon. There's, we don't know that you even need to do that. Maybe there's a way to, to do better than SVD with an exact algorithm. There's, we don't have any reason to believe that can't happen. Another thing that I'm interested in. You said, you, you use a random algorithm, right? We have a randomized algorithm, that's right. So there's no, there's no deterministic one. That's, the thing. Um, that's also true. I don't know a deterministic algorithm which will get the running times that we can get. But I, I mean, here, by, by exact, I, I didn't mean deterministic as opposed to randomized. I meant, um, I meant we give you, we're going to give you, uh, like for regression, say, we're going to find you an x that minimizes ax minus b up to 1 plus epsilon of the best possible that you can do. There's, we don't have any reason to believe that you can't just get the best one quickly, even by a randomized algorithm. There's no reduction. Like, it's, not even, it's not known that it's as hard as matrix multiplication, for example. It could be easier than matrix multiplication to get the exact uh, best solution for least squares regression. Okay, here's one that I'm very interested in actually, which says, what do, so let's, say, let's take these, the same distribution pies that I showed you before. It has s non-zeros per column and m rows. What do m and s need to be to preserve all the vectors in a set t, where t is an arbitrary subset of r naught? Okay? And I want an answer that depends on some very natural properties of t. So there are actually, such theorems do exist 
for dense matrices. If I say pick a random dense sign matrix where S is equal to M, then this is connected to, if people know about soups of Gaussian processes, there's some connection there and it's known that you can get something. But I want it for I want a sparse version of such a theorem. Uh, yeah, the connection is uh, so what they showed was you can choose M to be roughly uh, well. I'll say uh, so for people who So, yeah. Okay, so it's known that if you choose a dense matrix, say a dense sign matrix with enough rows, then um, you will preserve everything in T. Another thing is we don't have a lower bound showing that this trade off is optimal, that if you choose M to be, basically, that, well, that this setting of parameters is optimal. Um, actually, I even believe that, so as it's stated, we can achieve this when gamma is a constant. I believe you should even be able to achieve this with gamma being 1 over log d. If gamma is 1 over log d, then that's d over epsilon squared. And then this would be poly log d over epsilon. I believe that's, pos I believe that's true. Um, and kind of the barrier there really boils down to the graph counting that I didn't talk about. So, I mean, the, I skipped the whole business of once you have everything in terms of graph properties, how do you count the graphs? And it's, it's non-trivial, actually. Um, but I think that, I think there is some room for, for improvement in, in that graph counting. In particular, this is like 1 over gamma cubed in our proof. And really, I think it should be like 1 over gamma. And this goes back to this last open question is something that uh, you just asked, which is, is the epsilon squared optimal? And that we know that you, we know that it's d squared plus one over epsilon squared as a lower bound, but we don't know that you need to multiply these two terms. Uh, I suspect that you do, but we don't have a proof. Um, so that's everything I want to tell you. And any questions? Thank you very much.